So um, I am delighted to once again uh, introduce Linda Burkhart. Um, for those of you who weren't here last time, I hope you last week when we did part one, I hope that you uh, perhaps had the opportunity to watch the recording. If not, it is posted. But um, I'm not going to talk very long because I know Linda has lots of things to cover. So just to say how really uh, pleased we are that you're with us again, Linda, and that you have um, agreed to to do the second part. Um, and I'm gonna mute some of you. So with, oh, and the other thing I will say, people, if you want to ask a question, if you could please put it in the chat, I will try and be honoring the, or honoring, I will try to be watching the chat so that um, Linda doesn't have to worry about that. And if I think it's a question that's gonna need to be answered um, at the moment, then I will interrupt, but otherwise we'll, um, we'll make sure that we have those questions answered at the end. So, all right. Thank you, Linda. Take it away. Thank you, Kathy. Okay, so last time we ended on this slide, we were talking about Stepping Stone 2. So Stepping Stones 2 was the single switch, multiple locations, multiple functions. And before I get too far, I want to let you know that I will be updating the handout. There are some new slides from the handout that's posted, so you may want to check tomorrow or the next day to see if you want the updated handout. Okay, so step two, single switch, multiple locations, multiple functions. Here we've got the kid already understanding they can move to get something to happen, and we wanna broaden that schema. So we want that child to understand I can move different ways to get different things to happen, and I can do more than just turn on that one toy or make that music or whatever. There's lots of things I can do to have an impact in the world. There's um, is there? I'm trying to figure out there. I think I got it. Okay. So when we're talking about multiple locations, what we mean is um, trying the switch in multiple locations. We start talked about stepping stone one, where you find an act uh, a location for the switch where the child has that movement already. So they, it's an accidental switch application switch activation so that they can move and move in and out of it um, with the movement they already have. Then when we're moving to different locations, we're doing the same thing, but with other locations and also um, helping children play a game to sort of find it with different body parts, different situations. Again, paying attention to all those things I talked about in part one, their position and their interest and motivation and all of those kinds of things. Um, so we're going to try different sites. Again, we're not looking for the perfect switch site, but we're looking for some good sites to learn how to use. Okay. Um, so if you're looking at technology, the things that you want to be looking for are you need an immediate response from the switch and a short effect. So before we had a direct or short, now you can you really can move to a short. So it does something for like a second or two or six seconds or a short amount of time, but still not a long amount of time because we want to be able to have repeated activations to practice and play around and figure out where that movement is. Okay. Um, so thinking about different purposes for using a switch. So we do spin art, we do bingo, we do musical instruments, um, battery powered scissors, and we cut out art projects. We're using battery powered toys. I always like to suggest that they have a mission or a purpose. So instead of the girl just walking and pushing her toy, she, uh, you just take a piece of Velcro and a plastic plate and she can deliver a snack. Um, you can have uh, walking toys like the pig walk into the blocks and knock them over. You have the penguin that kicks his feet a lot, then he can kick a ball across to a friend. So always having something that it does, not just turn it on because you'll get kids to be um, to habituate and get bored with that fairly quickly. Other yeah. possibilities, driving an adapted vehicle. Do you have a question, Kathy? Yeah, there's a question that's saying, so what if, and I think it's an important question for you to address. Uh -huh. because, um, what if the child is visually impaired? How do they find the switch? How do they find the switch? Okay, good question. Um, one of the things that I will do is instead of moving the child's head to the switch, I will brush the switch 
lightly against their cheek or wherever the body part is. I'll tell them that I'm doing that before I do that. We've already built a, a relationship of that they know I'm putting a switch somewhere. And I'll say it's right here and I'll brush it there or I'll brush their body part. So they have a target to move to versus somebody moving their head. Because if you move a person's body, then they're more likely to push against that and move the wrong way, not the direction that you want them to move. So you need to get them to initiate by letting them know it's there and then exploring it. Also, we also pick other body parts and movements that they can do accidentally so that they can experiment and play with it the same way we did in Stepping Stone 1. Okay? All right. So we just have the uh, pouring cup, the music, take a picture, DVDs, all different kinds of things. This is also the stage I often introduced sequence social script. And um, the big word there that I should have said first was co-plan sequence social scripts. This is something that Caroline Musselwhite and I have written about, and there are handouts on my website on it. But the idea is that we work with the child to come up with a script that we can put into a sequence device, a step-by-step, -step, a sequencer, something where we can have repeated messages. The child helps create those and then uses that to have a conversation between people. Um, I think that's enough to say on that one. I, I would like to go into it more. I have videos, but we only have so much time. Okay. Um, we can do this on the GoTalk now on the iPad as well. I'm going to start my um, camera on the side so that I can show you my iPad. I can't leave it running the whole time because it uses a lot of resources. Okay. Nope, not there here. All right, so this is GoTalk Now. It's an app on the um, iPad. And what I have is a single switch connected to a switch interface. And the switch interface that I'm using, just move it over here a little bit, is the Tapio. Down, but the Tapio. And it's set so that I have one switch connected in there. Okay. And then this is set up for one screen at a time. It's used like a sequence social script. Again, you plan it with the kid. You have some standard phrases you can put in there and then you have and that they can choose and then you let them play. So the switch, activating the switch, will go through the script. That's right. And the person will respond, oh, what, what? And this is the part the child may have co-planned with you, that what they want to talk about. I got new shoes. Okay. And then they shows which transition state and then maybe it's up. okay um check out my feet and then they can show you their feet you know and make a comment aren't they cool okay and you know just continue what want me to show you how they sparkle yes or what do you think and then it ends Great talking to you. And it starts over so that you could talk to somebody else, so that they could have lots of opportunities. This gives them a lot of opportunities to activate their switch, multiple repetitions with variations and a real purpose to interact with other people. And with Go Talk Now, you have opportunities to, um, to edit it. If I go back to the home screen, so you can, even though there's only one button showing here, you can have things underneath that allow you to show that there's actually more buttons there of possibilities of ways you could start that conversation. And you can pick one each time as you co-plan it with the child. And then you have one to go on. So I think that's enough on that. Let me go back to this one. Up to, oh, I'm going to have to click that. Okay. So, um, so that's the co-plan sequence social scripts. Um, spinner games, um, letting the child be able to participate with other students who are playing a game and everybody's using the same adapted spinner. Um, there's, we, you can make one out of a battery powered fan um, and have different types of games that you construct for the kids to play. And this one, the gingerbread man, each kid gets a board, it's a Velcro. And when you spin a body part, you get to eat that body part or pretend to eat it. Um, there are iPad apps that have spinners on them. In order to access a switch with an iPad app, you make um, a recipe in the system settings. In other words, 
this, these are usually set to work with a gesture where you have to take your finger like you're actually spinning the spinner, which is not what a switch does. A switch just clicks it, right? So in the system settings on an iPad, you can write what's called a recipe and you can take your finger like the gesture and now a single switch will spin it if that's the gesture that makes the game spin. So that allows you to have a single switch. Also have a, um, a PowerPoint spinner to share with you that was created by um, Theo Quinn and she's generously allowed people to download it. It'll be on the handout so that you can see it. Basically, it runs in PowerPoint so that when you activate your switch, it spins and then it just spins. It's not whatever. And then whenever you activate it again, it stops. So it allows you to play a game or whatever, and you can change the numbers, the colors, whatever you want to do. You do have to activate your switch again to get it to start again. It allows you to have a spinner with a single switch. Linda, this yes. is my question. Can you put text in there or is it only numbers? Um, not sure I haven't played with the thing, but you should okay. be able to put text in there. I'll go back and play then. Yeah, you. you should be able to put text. <laughs> okay, cool. Okay, I'll have to play with it too. Um, but she did share that. She um, created that for our ATIA presentation and agreed to, I could share it here as well. But also there's a game board I just wanted to show. I like to make game boards out of carpet squares so that instead of it being on the surface where there's a lot of little pieces that scatter everywhere and hard to see where you're going, you can move it if you use Velcro. This is like indoor outdoor carpet. So the Velcro on the bottom of the car sticks to it. And then when you spin it or whatever, you get to move your, your piece or somebody moves it for you, one, two, three, four, you know, whatever. And as other people move, you can see where you can, who's ahead, who's behind more easily. And it sort of introduces kids to sort of like a bar graph um, to see, you know, that's how it works. And this is just made with the um, kind of Velcro that is um, used to tie up your tomato plants. It's real thin Velcro. You cut it in half the long way. You can make a grid any size, depending on how long you want to play the game, or if your spinner is asking you to add or subtract and you need larger numbers or whatever um, gives you. But then you can hold it up so the child has a better chance to see it um, visually, especially if they have vision technologies. Okay. Um, so that's a single switch spinner. Um, you can do computer activities. There's a number of different things that work with a switch on a computer. One of the things that I've been working on is, is in Mind Express. And you saw um, a video at the end of the last webinar of Analia actually doing one of these activities. And I'll just show you that real quickly. Um, not the video, but the activity she was doing. Um, she's using, um, let's see, where's my thing? I have to make sure my switch interface is set to, there we go. One switch, two switches. Move, move, oh, I want to go back to one Back switch. launcher, one switch. So one switch, so we're just using one switch. Oh, what's going on? And she was using the who's hiding, but she had pictures of her dad and her brother in there. And basically every time she hits, activates the switch, it, a short thing happens. One, two, three. Ta-da, there you are. And that would be her dad or whoever. And then makes some tape. Okay, and then another person would come out. Okay, I just activated the other switch. <laughs> I found it wasn't plugged in. <laughs> okay, so you see how that goes. Okay, um, so that basically is stepping stone two. It's getting that child to understand that they can do a lot and they might be using different body parts to do that. And that there's lots of reasons to activate switches. So you really have to give them a lot of purpose, motivation, interest, and um, tying it in with natural context. Then as quickly as possible, we move to stepping stone three. 
Because if a child can get to a single switch in multiple locations, they can get to two switches. So if they were using their hand, for example, and you put the switch on a surface near where their hand typically rests, and they're able to get it, and then you play around and you tease them and bring it over here in a fun way, in a way they're willing to do this. And they find it over here and they find it over here. Again, I'm not trying to torture kids. And um, find it in different locations. If they can find it in different locations, then they're ready for two switches, two functions. So that um, they're able to now explore. And you can really get into discrimination and problem solving when you get two switches. When you only have one, your only option is do it or don't. And sometimes the kids will don't just because that gives them that control. Mm -hmm. okay, but when we get the two switches, one switch does one thing, another does something else, they have more control and more um, engagement in that. While I have this um, slant board up, I just want to show you that sometimes the wires get in the way of kids' hands um, or their fingers get caught in the wires, they like the wires. What I want to show you is just take a piece of, of Velcro, here this wire is easier to see, and you put the Velcro over the wire. If you have on a carpet square, then it holds the wire in place so that their fingers don't get caught in the wires. Just a, just a tip. Okay, so in stepping stone three, now you wanna make sure that there's an immediate effect for each switch activation. Again, that's the same, but you have to also, the second switch has to interrupt the first thing. So it's not enough if you hit the one and it's playing and playing, you hit the second, nothing's happening yet, that's confusing. But as soon as you activate your second switch, then something needs to change. So it has to be able to both be immediately active. The one can keep going, but the second one has to definitely be able to start immediately. Okay, when we're moving to two switches, we really increase cognitive engagement. Um, kids, if they stay too long at the single switch um, phase, they get kind of bored and they don't see the point as, as much. Um, and you can really kind of pull their cognition in and show that, hey, you can do lots of cool things. So it really does increase that cognitive engagement. They need a reason to problem solve. So just uh, with toys and things, you could have two switches related to each other that do two really different things. So one kicks the ball across the room and a second one is connected to a voice output device like a step-by-step -step or something that says, throw it to me, okay? And then the one with the blocks, the pig was knocking down the blocks with one switch, but now you've got a second switch that says, build it up because after he knocks it down, you need some help. And if it's a sequence switch, you can have build it up put on another, make it taller, how about a blue one, give me a red one, whoa, that's getting tall, and all those kinds of social kinds of things that you could put into that sequence, okay? So we're looking for two switches now, so they have a reason. And the two functions need to be different enough. If they're just, hi, hello, they're not that different, <laughs> right? So they have to be cognitively clear. There's a reason I would wanna go to this one, and I can perceive the differences like I talked about in the um, uh, webinar last time. Um, sometimes when I move into two switches, I really consider using much smaller switches if the child's physically able to get to them. The reason is if I have a big switch, the kid can kind of get at it without looking. And if you put two big switches next to each other, it's really hard to discriminate which one you're hitting. But if you have two smaller switches, you can move them further apart. And now it's easier to perceive they're two separate switches. I also seem to often get those children that are able to get some better visual motor coordination to go towards the switches because they're more distinct and separate from each other. And that just shows the Velcro covering the wires as well. Okay, another thing that you can do with switches is recess the switches. Um, for children who have trouble, but uh, picking up their hands, and I'll just use this. this one off first. Um, if they have trouble picking up their hand to put it on the switch, you can take some foam or something and recess the switch so that you can teach them to slide over onto the switch instead of having to raise their hand, especially if raising means they have a large movement and have trouble grading that, but may be able to learn to slide it over. You can also use um, different types of 
swimming pool noodles to kind of anchor a switch so that they can use it with different types of movements and not have to get up on it um, depending on where they're able to to move so just a couple of different things i like a um, lock line if i'm mounting things around the child's head especially for the process of learning to use switch access because i have a lot of flexibility to move it to where i want so when the child um, is positioned i can give them just the amount that they can learn to move without having to work really hard or if their position changes the next day or the next half hour we can move it down we can move it up we can adjust it to give them success once you know they've learned some automaticity with movement then you anchor it and you want a mount that's not as movable but these are really good for learning also when you're using the lock line we attach it to the individual's um, uh, positioning equipment typically with um, removable electrical ties there's one here and you look for a place on the child's chair that's both vertical and horizontal. And we take the angle and we connect on a vertical place, but also the horizontal. Carol Goosen's talked about this years ago in her switch book, where if you just have the vertical part, the switch can swivel. Um, but if you have a horizontal part, then the switch can't. And if you're using two switches, you have horizontal across the, between them that you can connect to the chair. The other thing is I like to leave a few um, links behind the switch. If I don't, if I just curve it in like this, then the child's force often pushes the switch out and it's harder to stabilize. But if I leave a few um, links before I curve it back to their chair, or whatever, then they have that pressure to lean against. And so it gives it much more sturdiness to be able to hold it in place. So leaving a few straight links before I curve it. So Linda, I need to just ask a little question here. Somebody is saying to me that they're not seeing your demonstration. So oh, you're not? Whoa, 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 whoa. I think huh. most people are, but I just, um, I just wanna make sure that everyone understands if you use your, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, the, the, bleh, the thing at the top, um, your whose activation window, and you go show um, small uh, activation and the speaker video, then you will be able to see that. So it should be a little um, window up in this in the corner of your screen. Um, yeah. so if you can't do that, send me another text and I'll help you. But are some people seeing it? No, so are people are, are people okay, are people seeing it? Okay, so if you can't see it, scroll through or go to there's choices. There's hide the thumbnail video, there's show the small active speaker video, which is what you want to oh lots of people can see it. Okay, lots of people can see it. So okay, I'll good. work with the people who uh, need some help with it. Okay, good. Thank okay. You. All right, good. Yeah, because I want to show that, so that's yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's a way to mount switches early on um, so that you can have lots of flexibility. The other thing I really like about it um, is I can take the switch off and use it myself and put it back for the child to use. So they, I can take my turn and model and then bring it back, where if it's permanently screwed on to a mount, it's really hard to model with their That's the other reason I do that. Okay. Um, so a couple of software that good, good oldies but goodies that are two switch um, type, two switch to function um, uh, options. The, um, the uh, Switch in time, which has been around for a long time, still available. You can put different singers on the two different switches and the child can play different parts of the band. Um, another one that people don't seem to know as much is the super switch hitter. And that one actually allows you to do step scanning and other things, but it does have a two switch to function mode. And let's see if I can show that one here. Um, oops, it didn't show up. It was super, super switch hitter. It is like a baseball game and 
you actually have settings where you can have, so here's two switches. Uh, switch number one and three are on the same team. They're on the visitor team. So Jordan has switch one, Kyle has switch three, but it could be Jordan, Kyle, so you could have two here. You can also have another kid playing with two switches, or you can just have one each and just have a batter and a, and a, a pitcher. But it's nice because you have a batter on your team and also what they called either the fielder or the um, other player that's waiting to become up cheers and does different comments. So just to show you kind of how that works, we'll set a game. And on the one team, okay, so Jordan is the batter. If they activate their switch, it, it does the, um, if they activate the second switch on that same team, it would be the person over on the second. Oh, like, whatever. And if you're the, the two switches for the pitcher, you've got one that's the pitcher, and he pitches. And I love this because um, there's no timing. <laughs> it hovers and waits there until the child actually activates their switch and hits it. Okay. I could have played baseball if I had that world. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. And this person also has the, um, the other switch so that they can. Um, you get the idea. Okay. So oh, let's scrape out of that. No, I don't want to do that. I didn't need to do that. Darn it. I just quit my whole PC side. I have to open that again. Oh, that's okay. Okay. So I will open that again. So that those are just some goodies, but old, all these book goodies. And I, I think it's really nice to have lots of different software. Sometimes there's a lot of one switch software, but not two switch software. So as I'm starting this, I'll suggest what you can do is have one switch connected to the software, like a PowerPoint book or um, songs or different things. And the second one connected to comments. So you can connect that one to like a step-by-step that comments to things that would relate to the activity that's playing on the computer. Linda, I have another yep. question about visual, uh, students with visual impairments. And I have a couple of other questions, but I think this one is timely right now. So, okay. um, you know, these lovely games, which, I, you know, um, what about students with visual impairments? How can we help them to get that kind of play and engagement when they may not be able to see that screen? So, so they, there are good sound effects in that particular one. And with somebody sitting next to them and describing what's happening, that might be one thing. Um, the other thing is to try to pick things that um, have sound to them. So we have music, we have, you can use vibration, the other switch can be fan, you can um, do different kinds of tactile things as well as just the, um, the visual. Um, it's harder on the computer to just have auditory, but I try to keep in mind, find something that every time the switch is activated, there is a sound. And um, that, that is really the feedback that they need. And being in a group, knowing they hit the ball, it, you can hear it when it thumps it and it goes out and they cheer and that sort of thing. So they do get some auditory feedback from that. So try and choose things that privilege or that are, have good auditory support as well as- Yeah, there's a lot that doesn't. Yeah. There's a lot that doesn't. There's a lot of activities out there that don't ha that just have a visual change on the screen. Mm -hmm. I avoid those for those kids who have vision challenges. I want to find things or create things that there is always an auditory um, feedback as well every time that switch is activated. Nice. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, some two switch things that um, I've been doing uh, with Mind Express. Now let's see if I can get back here. Shrink that. Get to Mind Express. I had all these open, and then I quit it. <laughs> all right, so um, just in my um, two switches. So let me get my two switches. 
Again, I've probably been using proximity switches, but for this demo, I'm using these jelly beans. One switch, two switches. One of the things that I like with two switches, two functions is to really help them relate what they're doing visually on the screen. And again, this is harder for children with vision impairments, but I do use very simple colors and things on the screen so that it's easier for a child at, at some level of CVI to be able to see what's happening on the screen. I'm going to find. go to hide and find here you Smiley pick um, and you can pick up you can put all your own pictures in here but I'm just going to do the sun as you can see for a child with visual challenges there's not completely blind but child with visual challenges perhaps at um, higher phase two into phase three on the CBI range would be able to possibly um, see this now the green relates to the switch on that side of the screen and the red relates to the other. Now when I'm looking at myself, my red is on the same side as the red as the screen. Is it on you? No, it's opposite, but that's okay. okay. You're looking, yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so it's hiding behind the red. So we activate that one. Oops, where's the sound? Turn off my sound. Sorry. Okay, and then once it hides where again, is he? it says, where is he? And then you can try. Uh -uh. And that's where he was. Look again. Whoops. Look again. Nope. Okay, and then you look over here, and there he is. So you're getting, and for some reason the sound, I think I'm running too many things at once. <laughs> but yeah, we get the idea. But the idea is that it goes back and forth. Where is he? And the child is using some vision here to um, be able to locate it and um, find and play around and explore with that location. Linda, does Another it one. Go back and forth, or could you create a situation? What it does is it goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, then it goes back to the same side, and then it goes over. So it varies a little bit, but it tries to get the pattern established first, and nice. then it changes the pattern to get the child to be cognitively engaged. Nice, nice. So, okay. Um, so just to go back to just another example um, for Hide the, and find blocks, two videos. Two songs. And you can put your own videos, your own songs. Wacky Toss. Wacky Toss. You can put your own photos in if you want photos of the teachers. Monster One. Whatever. Monster Two. And Monster three. this is just, you know, it could be a little more age appropriate for some kids. Tomato and pillow. You can throw different Snowball things. Snowball and foam ball. Water, balloon, and egg. I'll pick that. And so they can just. Uh. Oh. 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 They throw the eggs. <coughs> you get the idea. <coughs> Okay, so the idea is two switches, two functions. Again, there is sound effects for those children who have vision challenges. I also try to keep the screen as simple as possible for those kids who might be able to um, visually see that as well. Okay. Okay, so those are just some two switches, two functions. I wanna show you a video. This one's building blocks. One switch builds the block, puts one block on. Hit it again, next block, next block, next block, and the second switch um, knocks them down. And in, the, in this particular video, Alex is um, playing with it. He keeps using big movements and hits one switch and knocks it down. One switch and knocks it down. And mother gets up and starts talking to him. Now, she won't be able to see the book she's using, but she's using this pod book to talk to him. So you'll hear her say that she thinks it's fun, uh, or funny, maybe she, I think she says, think it's funny, and then she suggests that he uses a smaller switch using the book. It's not a smaller switch, a smaller movement because he's pushing too hard, mm -hmm. and then he responds to that. So, just to give you a sense of what's happening. One block. See, it's a little too far. Ah. Ah. <laughs> One block. I think it is. That was smaller movements. Funny. I think it's funny too. That's a little too far. See how he's turning too far? And those are ASL proximity switches. One. 
one block Little. Just little movement. You don't need to have big movement. Little movement. Little one. Oh, that's getting too big. Oh. Giving him feedback. That was a good little movement. Good little movement. So you can see she's able to respond to her um, suggestion. And he's having such fun. <laughs> yeah, he loves blocks. He will spend hours building blocks. <laughs> Another um, set of uh, uh, software that you can use to do two switches, two functions is the inclusive technology switch skills for two, set one. Um, and that allows you to have a number of different uh, activities to use. I'll just get rid of this for a second and pull up set one. Um, there's a variety of different ones here. The one thing that I wish it did do would be, it, I would allow the child to pick it. You have to pick it for the child um, and then it gets it up but then you set it up for them. Now they have the two switches and I'll have to switch my um, switch interface because this uses space and enter. So I have to switch where well, my switches are plugged into and now it should work. So we've got space. And Well, that is an important thing to understand what the the different activities use different yeah. um, switch equipments. Yeah. Yeah. And for some reason, it's lovely demonstration by your presenter. It's not working. No, it's the Swiss software. It's not even working with the keyboard. Um, I think I have too many things open. Yes. Well, really. Oh my goodness. So, so tell us about what this does then. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me just get out of here because it takes a lot of resources. Um, mm -hmm. So what it does is, um, for example, you have one switch that's the guy laying in the bed and another switch is a closed door. And so if you open, if you click the switch with the closed door, the door opens and a musician comes in and starts playing loud music and then you hit your second switch and he sits up and goes shh and the door slams and he leaves. So it's just really um, clear uh, that uh, which switch does which and it's immediate. And then if you open your door again, then um, the, a different musician comes in with some more loud music. And so it's two switches, two functions. This one, uh, you have two basketball players. So whoever gets the ball um, is the one that's going to shoot. If you activate the switch with the one who doesn't have the ball, she says, give it to me, give it to me, or I want to turn. And so you have to find, you can, each switch is a different player in the game. So that kind of gives you some overview of some of those. There's some software by Judy Lynn who did some of this, one switch for each person on the side. If you have a switch applicator interface, you can set one switch for your, your music to go next song, next song, next song, and the other switch for um, uh, turn it on and off. So you have two functions on an iPad as well. Basically, we're then, reason we're doing two switches is to move to scanning. And um, there's different kinds of scanning, certainly automatic scanning, um, Inverse scanning and step scanning with delay all require timing. Automatic scanning is you activate your switch, it goes, 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 and then when it gets to where you want, you activate it again. Inverse, you hold it down, it moves, and you release it to select it. And step scanning with delay is you do step, but as soon as you stay off of it long enough, it selects. All again, timing. Two switch step scanning is the only one without timing. And we're using the two switch step scanning because 
of the timing issue requires automaticity of movements. And if the child had automaticity of switch access, we wouldn't be going through the stepping stone process. So we're trying to get to that automaticity, and so we're not using timing to teach it. Um, when we, we talked yesterday, or the last time we had this webinar, about needing to slow down and learn to use to be able to learn to use that graded movement. So we're helping ch children slow down. They don't have to time it. We can teach that movement. We can talk about little movements as opposed to big movements. We can use self-talk. We can use verbal referencing, different ways to help them teach, learn to use those switches. The other thing is more active. When you've got two switches, you move, 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 get it. You're doing something every time. When you've got a single switch, you're wait, 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 get up. Oh, uh, maybe I missed it. Try again, wait, wait. A lot of passive and unless a little active. And we know that the kids need a lot of repetition at their practice of their switches. So by using step scanning, they get lots more active participation to practice those switches. And it doesn't have to be at any speed. They can do it very slowly. They can wait as long as they want in between and still be able to do it, okay? Um, it also does, um, if the child has attention issues, and if they have vision challenge, they will have a need to visually check in or figure out where they are, sometimes monitor their safety in their environment, and they may stop if they hear a noise or something's happening. If you're doing step scanning with two switches, then when you hear that and you have that distraction, you can process it, somebody can tell you about it, you can say hi, you can have social connection, come back, and you're still at the same spot. If you're automatic scanning, it's going, going, going in your ear while you're trying to monitor and attend to something else. So it uh, helps for those children who are really needing to pay attention to lots of different things to know that it's still there. If they stop a minute and come back, it's still going to be in the same place, which encourages them to have those social pragmatic interactions um, during an activity as well. Okay. It also allows the child to pace the scanning themselves um, because the child is in control of the timing. It, don't, it doesn't move unless they activate their switch. So that allows that child to think as long as they want about whatever item that's on and then go to the next item. Okay. Once automaticity is achieved though, some individuals move to a single switch um, and some don't. Some stay with two switch step scanning if that seems to be more effective for them. And some now, if they're automatic with switches, can move up to automaticity. So it's not that we always have to stay with two switches, but I feel like it's a really good way to teach kids um, to use switches to the point of automaticity. Fatigue is often uh, suggested as an issue, um, and step scanning does cause more physical fatigue, but that physical fatigue is also building endurance. Um, unless you have a a degenerative disease or something where you have to be very careful about physical exertion. Um, you want lots of repetition to build that skill over many, um, act, many uh, activities. Um, so it really allows them lots of opportunities to practice. Um, the time scanning, time scanning, though, it seems less physically fatiguing, but it's actually more cognitively fatiguing because the child is to stay focused and pay attention the whole time cognitively and not get distracted and be able to get their switch at the right time. So you have cognitive fatigue that comes in when you're only using a um, single switch with some type of a, a timed uh, activation method. Okay. So we're moving into scanning. We go from two switches, two functions. Where do we go? Some kids just get it. They know it. They might be using a partner-assisted scanning system, and they, they already understand that it's no, 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 yes. They, they already understand that type of thing. And they um, can often skip the step and move on to stepping stone five. Some kids do need more practice here, too, um, just to differentiate, again, the two different purposes of the switches. Uh, so stepping stone four, four I call move, move, get, or learning to use two switch step scanning. Um, again, some of these children are able to skip the set step and some just need a little more practice here. The idea is now I'm learning the two functions are specific. One function is a mover, one functions the getter. So I'm learning that there are specific functions in the earlier step, there were lots of different functions the switches could do. 
I was learning to discriminate, there could be different functions. Now I'm learning a specific function. Okay, when you look at the technology, what do you need? You need two switches, but only one switch active at a time. So in this particular thing, you need an activity where one switch can move something across the screen or whatever, move it, and the other one doesn't do anything. So we got move, 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 and then nothing happens until it gets all the way to where it needs to get all the way across the path, and then the second switch gets it. We can practice a move, move, move with um, toys. You can connect a delay timer, like a, with a second or two, and um, every time they activate the switch, the robot moves a little closer, a little closer, a little closer, until it knocks the ball down and knocks the pins down or whatever. So we're moving, 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 getting the idea that it's moving. So you pick a battery power toy that does move in a straight line, okay? There are some activities, uh, again, by Judy Lynn in, her, in their um, learning two switch step scanning. The lesson four allows you to move the uh, hammer across, and when you get to the one where it's up in the air, you can pound it. Otherwise, it doesn't work until you get there. So you move that, um, you move that uh, hammer across the screen. Okay. Some examples. Let's see if I can go back to here and not get too crazy. Here. Let's see. Okay. Let's just go back here. So the move, move, get is here, and the example might be. Um, putting hats. So you can put your kid's picture in there and then the first switch moves the hat and the second switch doesn't do anything. The first switch moves the hat and again the last time when it gets finally closer I also make an auditory difference for those kids who have more vision challenges. So the first switch doesn't, the second switch doesn't do anything but the first switch moves the hat. and then the First switch stops working and the second switch works. And then you get a different hat and you move, 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 move it over. It's, it's definitely doing weird things here. So Linda, I'm gonna take, I mean, I'm gonna take a little minute to say what I'm loving it about what you're doing is being very intentional about the two switches and two functions and then thinking what they actually do. People are asking on um, the chat, um, uh -huh. so how do we decide what step a child is at? I'm thinking about students who haven't, uh, who have been exposed to switches but have not mastered and mm -hmm. someone quite probably uh, I think appropriately said you need to go through the steps and see where they really are at in the steps. Yeah that's it and it <laughs> makes like a minute or two on the first two steps you know you might just be seeing do they know how to get to those switches okay they do you know we've been two switches two functions. One of the things that I have found clinically and some um, general surveys of, of people using this is that if you give an opportunity for a child who to have lots of two switch two function opportunities, they move more quickly and easily into two switch step scanning. Yes. They, can do, they, can, they get it faster. If I just start at two switch step scanning and I skip that two switches, two functions, I find it takes longer and it's harder. But that really, um, if kids have that opportunity, it does really work. And this is just Analia showing you, she's just moving a video. She's moving a, um, a, uh, She's choosing more of it first. And then there's a um, fire truck or a tractor. She's moving across the screen. So I was just some talking here. There we go. There we go. There she goes. And then when it gets there, she activates the other switch and it starts a video. So it brings in a video that you have put in. So that's the idea. Okay. Back here. I need to move along here. So two switch skills for two, set two. I showed you set one before, but I'm just running too many things to show it to you. Um, two switch skills for two, set two, again, by inclusive TLC. 
the one switch might be the item over here and the other the alligator. The one switch, it has two difficulties levels. You want the easy difficulty level so that it move, 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 move. It goes into his mouth and then it doesn't go any further. It just wiggles there. And then the second switch, he slams his mouth shut and eats it or spits it out, whatever. And the basketball, same thing. Um, you have to throw it to each player with the single switch. And then once it gets here, you have to use your second switch to shoot it. So those kinds of things, move, 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 get. So now we're moving into stepping stone five, which is two switch um, step scanning now, actually, but at the failure free level. And now there's lots of software available. I was trying to cherry pick some software that could do the earlier steps, but there's lots of grid type programs that can do two switch um, scanning. So now you have a lot more options in what's available. And the idea here, um, is that there is no right or wrong answer. I can give the child a launcher of lots of different activities and they can go in and they can play with them. Then there's a stop, they can get out of it, they can take another one. So they really feel that control. They get lots of intent, purpose, and variation by being able to practice that two switch. Um, it used to be called errorless learning and then some vendors came out with this concept of their activities they can only do it right. They don't allow a child, they block a child from doing the wrong answer. And they call that errorless learning, which is exactly opposite of what I'm talking about. I think <laughs> problem solving is really important. So talking to Karen Erickson one day, we came up with failure free with feedback. Nice. And I think that makes more sense. It's failure free. They, there are some things that do different things, but they're not going to get wrong kind of answers at this point. Nice. Okay. So these technology features, um, the scanning doesn't start until the child activates switch one. So they know they're in control. It's not just, sometimes the teacher starts it and the kid's like, what's happening? I'm not sure what's going on. So they need to start it. Um, and then the second switch interrupts the sound animation or anything that the first switch is doing. So then it goes to the next, um, or I just mean that, excuse me, I said that wrong. The first switch activates it and then activating it again interrupts what it was doing and goes to the next item, next item, next item. So it's immediate. So I know I went to the next one versus that's finishing talking and then it's going to go, right? And then again, this the immediate of the second switch. Um, I also need the switch to be released each time they go to a new item. So they activate it, but they have to get off of it in order to be able to, um, to do it because otherwise it's inverse scanning. Right. If they lean on it and it goes across, then it's inverse scanning. It's not step, step, two switch step scanning. So it needs to be, they actually activate it. And when you go look at some software, their two switch settings don't do that. Or, so you have to look at different things and check it out to make sure that's what you want. If you can make a launcher, that's highly desired. So what by a launcher, I mean that the child has the opportunity to pick what they want to do, a bookshelf or a, a, just a grid that has a link to all of their activities. Um, I showed you uh, Tar Heel Gameplay or, uh, org as a single switch kind of thing, but you can do multiple switch things here because you can set it up so that you can go to it, and I won't take the time to show it right now, but you can go to, there's a link here on the handout, um, and it'll take you to a favorites. If you set up your favorites, then they can step through. And then when the activity comes up, you can set it so it comes up. Now this is a, it's a, oh, maybe I need to show it real quick. Much easier to show it than to try to, I think. I can get there really quick. Okay, so we do. So here we go. Oh, song. A-I-O-U-O McDonald vowels. Okay, then I second switch activates it. And sing the first verse. Old MacDonald had some vowels. A E I O U. E. Now, there's a verse for each letter. So now you can set it so they can step scan I. and pick what letter they want to do, and then it'll go to that verse. It'll go to the I. And on his farm, he had an I, A-E-I-O-U, with an I-I here and a... Okay. Yeah. 
a little bit better. <laughs> so you can actually have favorites on Tarho gameplay and do those kinds of things that are have step scanning in them. It's the more advanced way to do it, but it's real easy to um, set them up with any YouTube video. If you have a YouTube video that has different verses, it works really well to set it up so the kid can pick which verse they want to hear and gives them that control. So each individual gets their own launcher and their activities designed for them at whatever le level they're working at. And then the child can go through and select what they would like to do. So I don't know if I can show you one real quick. So for example, I wonder if I go to uh, Natalia. She has a launcher and then she right could get floor. to all of her type activities. Um, a scan and paint by Judy Lynn allows you to pick different pictures and different colors. So there's the cause and effect amusement park. There's some different ones that you do this type of thing. On the Go Talk Now, I'm not going to turn this one on right now, but it's instead of using one button per screen, you can use as many buttons as you want. And what I did is I made like a little alphabet book, but I only put in a few letters at a time in the beginning of the year. And as the kid learns them, they add more. And then they go to a page where you can play videos for different things that are related to the child. So you can take pictures of the kid doing things and then put them in to their, like, um, if they ride their motorcycle, a pretend motorcycle, whatever, they can take a picture of them riding it and put it on the end page and do it with them. So you co-construct this over the entire year, building a beginning sounds kind of book for them to play with. Um, Marble Sauce has a potato face. If you have good vision, you can um, make different faces out of the uh, potato face. Um, the uh, grid uh, three, you can choose a video and I can do this on uh, Mind Express as well so that you can actually go out to YouTube and have videos already set there. We'll see if that is actually working. Let me see. Gotta move this out of the way. Okay, so let's Grid scan. Explorer Biomes. Learning about ecosystems. So these are just YouTube videos and it goes to that site and then you get the video. Theo Quinn made this um, template as well. And you can play pause it. Play or pause. So you get and then play or pause. And you can go back. back to other videos. So the idea is that the child might be studying something in school, and instead of teacher side, here's a video. You have a variety of different videos that the child can go in and out of, pause and play, and have an option to see and use um, themselves. Make a monster, just a different, um, or make a face. Again, another one from Mind Express. I keep leaving these over. So. Analia's video, so she has a dress up book. And this one, she gets to choose her different Analia, people. Mom, Tommy, Rudy. We'll do Rudy. <laughs> and this allows the child to just um, This is a dress silly up dress up book. You can create the book any way you want. Rudy's silly dress up book. And it comes up with options. <laughs> Elephant nose, pig nose, clown nose. Put on the clown. Clown nose. Poor Rudy. Rudy has a clown nose. <laughs> and then you get the idea. It goes and give them different ears. You can go through this, which is elephant ears. Elephant ears. And then it makes a book at the end, Rudy and you can go elephant through and ears. read the the book. So just different ways to give them opportunities. There's no wrong way to do this activity. They can do it, but they can have input into it. They can make decisions to create it the way they want it versus um, being told, make them do this or show me this or find that. It's more of a, they actively involve. We do failure free writing where the child um, co-plans with you certain phrases and the child can go through and pick. So in this one, um, the child uh, would pick something like, um, things I like, foods I like, my friends, things I don't like, things I wish I could do, things I might 
want to do when I grow up. And then they would link to all the things that that child has selected. So when they write a letter, then they can pick which pieces of that letter they want. And it's a closed set, but it allows them to be able to send a letter to um, somebody that they can read um, and whatever. So it's a failure free kind of activity. And you can do the same kind of thing on Clicker um, with the idea of being able to use um, words or sentences and put them together, okay? Um, making three letter words, just an activity that I do where kids can play around with beginning sounds and ending sounds. So when I'm still working on it, Mind Express, if I go back to Analia's, um, Dress I'm up sure walk. she can do that. Let's Make three letter words. So it's simply, Click to start. That's the click to start. They have to activate their first switch and then activate their second switch in order Let's to see start if you it. you can make a word. Here are some letters for you to choose. Okay, and you've got the first switch. B, C, D. And select it. D, D. Let's make a word that starts with D. Now choose an ending. Okay, so then you get to pick your endings. And um, And go to your other switch. D, og, d, og. First you take a D, d, d. Then you take an og, o, g, og. Put them both together and you've got dog, d, og, d, og, d, o, g, dog. Dog. A dog says woof woof. I try to some dog. Dog. I try not to always have visual moving See and sound at the same time. Word. That's why Here I came on quiet for you to choose. Okay. Go back. Um, okay, so that was stepping stone five, stepping stone six. Now you are these are for the child maybe who's just randomly doing all the stepping stones and not really yet targeting. We, now you move to a particular target. So you might have a bunch of blanks and then you go for the one that you're trying to get through. Probably the easiest to see that is the mole. If you use your first switch to move the bat over the hole um, and you hit your second switch, there's nothing to hit. Go to the next one, there's nothing to hit. And it just goes boom, 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 but it doesn't hit anything. But if you hit it over the mole, it bangs him on the head and he goes under, right? So now there's a target. Now we're actually trying to get to a particular thing. Never do this until they've had lots of experiences with stepping stone five, failure free step scanning. But when you feel like you're ready to refine it a little or you really want to help them see how it works, then you can use stepping stone six to help them get to a particular target. Okay. I'll just say that in my experience, when I was doing this stuff, I think I jumped to this way too soon. I mean, it was a long time, right. but I remember going to the, you know, switch in time stuff and moving kids to this kind of time stuff where they just, yeah. So really. Yeah, and this isn't timed, but well, it doesn't mean they have to get the correct one. Yeah. Yep, yep, it still matters. It's still and I really feel they need more problem solving and playing with the motor yep. use of the switches at yep. the two switch step scanning yep. level before they get here. Yep. So there's a variety of different ways. Um, but again, only for kids who've had lots of that uh, failure free experience it, and then trying to get to that specific target. So, so Linda, one of the things I'm thinking that might be helpful is if we took this and said, Here's some, here's some software and activities for step one, two, three, four. Maybe you've already done this. Maybe you've already put that into like a, a, a sheet, but- um, that's, that's, that's partly in my um, article right, that's online right, and also right. the handout from ATIA that Theo and I, Theo Quinn and I did. At well, the end of that handout is a list of the different resources and the steps for the different things Right. Um, so, so just to remind people, if you haven't read the article, it's there, but also we'll try and make sure that you have this kind of stuff. Because I think uh, my expectation is a lot of these, you know, I remember Judy Lynn's software. I know lots of this stuff, but I think for lots of people, it won't be particularly familiar. So to put it in a, a list and, and to give you some That's of That's the way it is at the end of the handout for the ATIA this year. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Thank so you. you can look at the bottom of that handout. Awesome. Okay. Great. So the features are same as Stepping Stone 5, 
plus the ability to have some sounds, um, some cells blank or say a sound like nope or click or more or not there yet or whatever, so that the child gets some feedback every time they go to those cells, but they're not the right one. And then the cell that has the action or whatever in it would have um, a different uh, cue, like sing a song, and then it would play a video or whatever. Okay, so that's stepping stone sticks. Um, again, some children don't need that. Some children do. It depends. I use it if I feel like I really want that child to start um, being a little bit more, they, they love everything and they're just doing it and they're not really paying much attention to which one they choose yet, but they've had lots of experience doing that. Okay, stepping stone seven, now we're increasing accuracy. Um, so now there are right and wrong answers um, and the child is uh, able to do correct or incorrect and they get feedback for the incorrect kinds of things. Um, they also might be using a simple powerful page set which um, on their high-tech speech generating device would be the same vocabulary um, organization that they use in their um, non-electronic version, but a simplified set so that they have less to deal with, less balls to juggle when they're doing the high-tech. And then they have a button that says, get my book. So different things, beginning sounds, different things where there is a right or wrong answer. If you have a kid who has good vision, you can use the iPad apps using the pipe cleaners. A pipe cleaner can outline the different things. Lots of apps are not switch activated. And the, and the uh, interface for using switches on, on an iPad can be really cognitively um, challenging. It's a real high cognitive load. So if you had an adult who lost motor skills, that might be really good for the switch access on an iPad. But unless games are specifically designed for switch access, then it's really a high load for our kids who are just learning to use switch access. So if they have vision, I use the pipe cleaner to outline different items that they could click, and I use partner-assisted scanning. So I'll name them and show them the different items, and they'll indicate nope, 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 and yes, and then I'll click it for them. So it gives them access to lots of different kinds of things, and you can do different types of um, uh, making words and things, and I can go through the three letters to choose. We want to write the word bad. Is it this one, this one, this one, or is it T, A, or B? And then we can do it, and the, the app will do the animation and the results when I select it. Okay, Stepping Stone 7, um, the technology features are really the same as uh, Stepping Stone 5, um, but different selections have very different results. So there's clearly perceiving differences here that there are some right things and some things that were not correct. Sometimes they're funny to get them the wrong. It's not like I'm collecting data on getting it right, but it gives them the experience that they have different results from their efforts. Okay. Um, here I do a, um, this is one of my uh, Mind Express book um, activities. So let me click go into here and let's see, pull up a different kid. And this one is just a, like a, a listening comprehension book. So first switch, and you have a place for tell me about tell this me book. about this book. That would be the purpose for listening. Read the cover. Start reading this go book. Right into reading the book, and it reads the page to you. Read this page. Dogs have very good noses. Dogs can smell things that people cannot smell. Dogs can recognize people by how they smell. Every person smells different. Dogs can tell people apart. Dogs can find you when you are hiding. Dogs help police find lost people. And this activity you can do without vision and you can do, you don't have to put a picture there. You can have just text and you can do it. So now instead of read this page, it's come to read it read again. Read this page again. Because I think individuals need the opportunity to read it again as many times as they want to and then get to the comprehension Ask question. Ask me a question. And in this case, I have a comprehension question after each page because I want that child to be able to um, do a listening comprehension or reading if they're reading, but the listening comprehension, and when it's listening comprehension, if they have visual challenges, it's a lot to read a whole book and then answer a question or read a lot. So I'm doing one page, you can put a little text or you can put a lot of text on that page. 
Um, and then the question, if they sit like that, Lots then it gives the, the question. To find the lost person. And it gives feedback. His tail. Um, either. His tail. Dogs don't use feedback. their tails to find people. Listen again. Or what does the dog use to find the lost person? Auditory feedback. His tail. His teeth. His teeth. No, a dog doesn't use his teeth to find people. So you can have either he choice. He uses something else. Listen again and see if you can find out what a dog uses to find lost people. And then this one. What does a dog use to find the lost person? I always. His tail. His teeth. I always his nose. I don't know. Read it again. Because then the child will go back, it'll read that page, and then it'll come back here and ask the question again. Which and then if you write it in, they to do, right? His, go back into the book and find out what nav. they're missing. Yeah, they don't have to navigate. It goes back, it reads yeah. it, it comes Love back it. here. Because I think asking them to navigate at this level is just too much for them to have to figure out and too much cognitive attention to the switches and not enough cognitive attention to the task. Nice. So if they pick it, His they nose. get feedback Lots and it goes to the next one. To find a lost person. And I set His this nose. up as a template so you can put your That's own right. stories and things in here. Really good noses. Um, they and their nose find people. The last lost. thing I want to say about it is that you have the option to do right and wrong answers, but you also have opinion questions. So read this. Page. I won't read it here. Ask I'll just go to the question. question. Notice this question. All Don't of the items are correct. Fails. So it doesn't matter which one they pick, Relax. they'll get feedback. And then, yeah, Relax. that one. Yes, many people feel more relaxed when they're petting a dog. Okay, so you have that op option to not have to do right or wrong. You can also do opinion type questions. So that's just, that's one I'm still um, working on. So then we get to Stepping Stone 8. <laughs> and Stepping Stone 8, they've reached automaticity. Here I say, okay, now we can use switches to do other things. And we can use it for um, doing much more complex things. They write with the alphabet maybe before this level, um, playing around with it. But now when they're writing with the alphabet, they are trying to get to a particular letter and they're getting there because they have develop that um, automaticity to that point. You can give them their robust um, communication system using the two switches now because they can do it. They might move to automatic scanning at this point, but now they have that automaticity. And just to quickly summarize, um, this is a little boy in um, Australia, one of Gail Porter's students um, who I met when he was like 20 months old and we started him on two switches. And he's at the Cerebral Palsy Education Center, CPEC in Australia. And starting with, they started him with the one per page communication book where he was able to say um, a full range of early functions and communicate. And we started with a single switch, moved into two switches, two functions. He used those for playing activities, for driving remote controlled toys at home. And his mom set him up a lot of times to just play with the switches, two switches, two functions when she was doing other things. He moved to his communication book with um, more expanded functions and the pull-off columns so that he could reduce the, the vision, even though it was a whole page that it came from. We could give him partial um, at a time, and he began communicating with that. Then on his speech generating device, we added a simple, powerful page set, or they did, they added a simple, powerful page set, um, which is the same language organization as his high tech, as his non-electronic system, but less vocabulary. Mm -hmm. So that these are the vocabulary that are really personally meaningful for him, and things that really make a difference to say out loud across the room. Um, and a way on that SGD that also says get my book so he can get access to more robust language in his non-electronic, okay? Then he gets and babbles with his SGD, gets interaction, explores the language, um, gets feedback, and then he's able to put the robust language into his SGD and use it with two switches across the day, whatever he wants. He can use his book, he can use his um, device. It's up to him according to the context and his preferences. Um, he then expanded um, to exploring some head switches, which he found um, useful and uses a full robust uh, language system 
with his um, head switches, and he uses um, a light tech robust system with his um, uh, non electronic system. Just to quickly show you a short clip of him, here he's using his head switches at this point. Okay. Just a real quick. You can see he's got them mounted where he can get to them. He's hearing the auditory prompt in a private ear speaker. And then he's going to speak his message window. And you hear the message he's constructed. I want movie DVD cars. I want. I want movie DVD cars. I want. Nice. So he's hearing the auditory. I want movie DVD cars. I want. He, he really got into it. And they said, no, not right now. But um, so the he's auditory hearing prompt the auditory coming. prompt in a private ear speaker. That's the little white speaker here near yep. his ears, yep. quietly. Yep. And then when he hits, activates his message window, it speaks it out loud to the person he's talking to. And that is because his vision isn't adequate to let him understand what is presented in front of him without exactly. that. Exactly. Okay. okay. Exactly. He has cortical visual impairment and he uses visions for some activities during the day, but yep. most of his communication is auditory. Although it is visual on the screen, it's consistent, yep. and if he can get that information, he does. But he's relying mostly on the auditory for that um, level of communication. And his book is mostly auditory scanning. The only visions they'll use is a strip like this to show him. And for example, he'll pick a sentence, start, he'll start a sentence, and then he'll go over to the main words here, the opinion words, and they'll show him good, cool, nice, beautiful, and he'll pick one of those, like good, no, cool, yes. And then they look under in the auditory scan. Cool, okay, all right, lucky, groovy, exciting, whatever the words are under that. So he's using a combination of some vision, but mostly auditory. Right, good. I just, yeah. Okay. And that's it. <laughs> wow, I just wanted to thank the um, kids themselves, the individuals that I work with for teaching me so much and also for the families that generously allowed me to use their photos and videos. I think. Totally concur with that. Thank you. And I also want to say thank you to, uh, to you for taking us through this in, um, in such a um, systematic, I guess it was quick, but it's a systematic way, you know, and, and I, this is your time, people, if you want to post some questions, I will, I will ask them. But while I'm letting you post your questions, uh, oh, here's one. When a child is using switches to access AAC, can they also use the same switches to access toys or games, or should they be using different switches? That depends on the kid. Sometimes I use, I use the exact same switches for many kids. Some children can shift over, the ones that are using their hands. Some of the children that might have been direct selectors, if they had good vision, um, are using two different switches for their games and because they have the motor abilities to do that. But typically, many of the children that have more physical challenges, more severe physical challenges, are using the same switches and they switch over between them. They need a way to ask for somebody to help do that, or if they are doing something like powered mobility and they have the um, ability to switch through that themselves between their computer, their communication, their powered mobility, there you can do some of that electronically. But if they if you don't have it all set up that way, you at least need them to be able to request within each thing um, how to get back to each other. Yeah, great question. Great question. Any other questions out there? Um, that was fabulous. So while you're thinking of your questions or articulating them, I'm going to again articulate what was jumped out at me is the systematicity of this, right? Is that you do this first and you let kids be, be good at this before you pop them onto the next thing. And right. I think we, and I'm going to speak for my own self, when I used to do this more than I do now, want to jump too soon. And jumping too soon 
um, doesn't give the kids the grounding to move forward. So I think I, I so appreciate that. The other piece that I so appreciated you. And I just wanted to make an example, a, a, a say something to that too, Kathy. I'm also using this in conjunction with a non-electronic communication system. So right. I'm not desperate for them to be able to use their high tech and everything and juggle all those balls too soon because right. they have access to a robust language system at yep. whatever language level they're at, yep. at the same time they're developing this. So we're working in parallel. So I, that's one reason that makes it possible. And thank you for saying that because I think that's a really critical issue is that this is not getting ready to have a robust language system. You've got it at the, you've got it. You're talking, you're, and you're co-planning, you're co-constructing. That was the next thing I was going to say is that you're not just putting words in kids' mouths here. You're not just, you are, they are along with you in that, um, which I think is also critical, but it, the way, uh, as always, what you, you just said was better than I was going to say, that they have a system there, um, a robust system that they can engage, communicate with you, and can, can co-plan and co-construct some of these things that they're doing. Absolutely. The other thing that really stood out for me again today, which goes to what you start, is that you're really helping kids to learn problem solving skills. Yes. This is always about problem solving, right? So, okay, so how am I going to get to that? Or how am I going to make that move? Or how am I going to, oh, oh, look, this this uh, doesn't make the, the, the hitters do it or whatever. So there's so much really good problem solving cognitive development in all of this, so, which I just- And that's what the research tells us, that in order to learn a more to movement to automaticity, the child has to be able to problem solve. So that's where that's come from, both educationally as well as motorically, cognitively, linguistically, all of it. And then my, my final, child-centered control is critical. <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, I, and you live that and you, you say it in everything that you do. So thank you again for reminding us of this. Thank you for, I mean, I know people will probably need to watch this again, but we will have it archived. Um, thank I'm you. I'm sorry it went so fast. <laughs> well, you were great. And we give you this little tiny window. I also need to tell all you guys, I think we're going to probably bring her back here again, not too long distant future. So that will be great. Um, last chance, any questions that you have that you want to ask? Thank you all for staying on. I know we went over, but it's important that you get to step eight. Um, thank you, Linda, for your generous uh, time and always for your expertise and wisdom, experience, all of that stuff. Well, thank um, you for having me. <laughs> oh, we're very, very, very glad to have you. So um, with that, I will say, um, go out and have a lovely evening. And for you, it's late. So you probably need to go and have your dinner or something. Yes. <laughs> and everyone else, thank you for um, being here. And um, we will, we will, let's go do great things with kids. So all right. Okay. Thank you. And Lynn. I'll have that revised handout on um, up in a few days. Hopefully Perfect. tomorrow. Perfect. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Lots of thank yous coming in on the chat. So, all right, okay. folks, I'm going to say okay. good night and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Okay. Bye, Linda. Okay. Bye.